Buddy Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Holy smokes, it's Monday here on this show, and have we ever got a lot, a lot to talk about here today. Mark Ramondi on Twitter, AW star Jeff Hardy arrested Monday in Florida on three charges. The most significant, a DUI, its third offense in the last 10 years. Per online court records, that is a third degree felony. Hardy is currently in custody, $3,500 bond. Hardy's first court appearance, scheduled for 1.30 local time Tuesday. The other charges, driving while license is canceled, suspended or revoked, violating restrictions on his driver's license. Both of those are misdemeanors. Hardy is scheduled for a tag team title ladder match with his brother Matt on AEW Dynamite on Wednesday in St. Louis. Also set to headline AAA's big Triple Mania stadium show in T1 on Saturday. Tag team match with Matt. No word on the status of these matches. This story is uh, just now breaking. So as of this moment, there has been nothing Official from AEW, but I would presume that uh, A, there ain't going to be a ladder match performance by Jeff Hardy on Wednesday, and I guess we'll find out uh, what happens. But uh, this is not good, obviously, uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, the Tammy Sitch situation, I mean, this guy cannot be driving. He absolutely cannot be driving. And uh, it's amazing when you think about his departure from WWE when he walked out of that match and they immediately assumed that he must have been on something. And he and his brother and his family, they were immediately like, you know, release the drug test, release a drug test, release a drug test. Because apparently he wasn't actually on anything. He just was done with it and he walked out. And then he goes to AEW and now here we are. Another DUI arrest, third in 10 years. So, uh, yeah, that's just the beginning of everything we got to talk about here from this insane weekend. So back in a moment with more Observer Live. Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, not here. He's attempting to uh, connect. If it uh, does not work, I'll try to reset everything after this break. But I'm not sure how much you'd say in this segment anyway, because there's a lot, obviously, as noted. The situation with Jeff Hardy... Third DUI in 10 years. Third degree felony. $3,500 bond. Court appearance scheduled for Tuesday. Charges driving while license is canceled, suspended, revoked, violating restrictions on the driver's license. I... I don't... know. I mean, as everyone's talking about here today, there's Uber, there's Lyft... There's taxis. There's multiple people here on the chat noted. You're Jeff Hardy. You can get a ride. So, as noted, uh, nothing official from AEW. We may hear something during the show. I don't know that they're going to release him, but I would not be surprised if they released him. So, we will see what happens as we get going here today. Now, the only release this weekend, two dimes. Troy Two Dimes Donovan, released from WWE, a, quote, policy uh, policy issue. And uh, he was told, I guess, to lay low and maybe in a year we can do this again. But he confirmed the release in a tweet uh, Monday morning. Thank you to everybody who has reached out. Mistakes happen. Lessons are learned. A bump in the road does not define me, though. I will be back. So uh, now we just have stacks. And uh, everybody in Legato del Fantasma, who's now part of uh, Tony D'Angelo's crew. Uh, NXT, uh, this hasn't really been much of a story, but it should be a story. NXT has started touring again, which is good. Because everybody there, you know, the Tony D'Angelo's and uh, basically everybody, with the exception of your Roderick Strong's and such, you know, they need they need to get matches in, they need to work, they need to get on the road, and uh, that began this weekend, and uh, everybody's getting the opportunity to get more ring time in in front of a live crowd, and uh, and Tony D'Angelo uh, this weekend went down with what appeared to be a shoulder injury, and as of right now, it appears he's fine. Uh, there were essentially two stories out there, one story that he was uh, working the injury, 
the other that he was injured, but it actually wasn't a bad injury at all. But he appears to be fine, so so he'll be back on on uh, on the show on Wednesday, presumably. And uh, on the subject of that, by the way, Brian Danielson finally did do an interview and admitted that he worked the entire thing uh, when he fell. Actually, it wasn't it wasn't Danielson; it was somebody else who. Uh, who did the interview. I can't remember, but anyway, they, they also confirmed that uh, Brian Danielson never was stuck uh, between the ramp and the ring. Uh, they claimed that he uh, he actually did slip, and then once he slipped and got stuck, uh, he decided he was going to, to work it from there, which, I mean, that may very well be what happened. I, I kind of was under the impression that the entire thing from start to finish was, was a work. But suffice to say, he didn't really get stuck. He didn't really injure his leg. He just decided he was going to go with it, and and he did. So, anyway, he's okay, and uh, Tony D'Angelo appears to be okay. So, uh, that is all good news. Uh, a lot of shows this weekend. We can talk about Rampage later, SmackDown later. Both good shows. Uh, Dominion as well. And uh, there were a number of title changes at the Dominion show. Jay White won the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship from Okada after hitting a Blade Runner. And so that means that uh, it is not going to be Hangman versus Okada in a uh, a singles match for the title. It is going to be, we don't know, but probably, probably a triple threat or a four-way. Uh, my guess is it'll probably end up being Okada, Jay White, Hangman Page, and Adam Cole in a four-way for the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship. But we'll find out more on Wednesday. But it's definitely not going to be the singles match for the title of uh, Hangman versus Okada. We also had Will Ospreay beating Sonata to win the vacant IWGP United States Heavyweight Championship. And it's a weird story because uh, Juice Robinson had won the title. Juice Robinson was the champion. Juice Robinson then went down with appendicitis. Then, for reasons I cannot explain, they announced that he was going to defend the title at Dominion. But then it turned out he wasn't ready due to appendicitis. But then, because he had been billed as defending the title, now, because these are the rules in Japan, now they have to strip him of the title. So if they just never announced that he was going to defend the title, he would still be the champion right now. So presumably, they wanted to do a storyline where he was stripped of the title, and then obviously he's going to uh, to come back to fight for it when he is better. But uh, the new champion is Will Ospreay. He defeated Sonata. We also have uh, a new never open weight champion. Carl Anderson beat Tomatonga to win the title. Uh, So this is the first ever singles title for Carl Anderson in New Japan. Coming off COVID, by the way. So So that is that. Uh, We have new IWGP heavyweight tag team champions. Great O'Conn and Jeff Cobb beat uh, Bad Luck Fale and Chase Owens. So probably some sort of match involving Great O'Conn, Jeff Cobb, FTR, Uh, Something like that at the Forbidden Door pay-per-view. And then for the provisional title, uh, it was the King of Pro Wrestling provisional title. And uh, whoever got the most counts in 10 minutes was going to end up the winner. And uh, Shingo beat Taichi. And uh, this match actually was a pretty great match. And if you've watched a lot of the uh, King of Pro Wrestling title matches, they are not usually great matches. But I think the the key to this one is they had a they had a 10 minute time limit. So they put the clock up on the screen. They only had 10 minutes. They they actually didn't start going for pinfalls immediately. They kind of built up to it a little bit. And then, you know, they had the the score on the bottom. And it was funny because uh, the announcers did not trust this scorekeeping that was on the screen. So, you know, Chris Charlton's furiously writing down how many pinfall attempts and numbers each guy had but uh it actually was it was exciting it was well worked and uh yeah if you normally avoid the kopw championship matches that one actually was pretty good and then obviously the uh the big one because it has aw title ramifications uh hiroshi tanahashi in fact beat hiroki goto so it's going to be uh tanahashi versus moxley for the interim title 
coming up at the Forbidden Door pay-per-view. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to say it's a spoiler, but um, I'm pretty sure that Moxley's winning that interim championship. I I thought that, like, if it were me, I'd put the belt on Tanahashi. But now I'm not sure I put the belt on Tanahashi. Because the whole reason that they have created this interim title is because CM Punk has uh, uh, surgery on his lower leg, which apparently uh, that was something Jim Ross came up with on the fly as he was doing commentary, because I guess they they use that terminology like in the uh, college football. But anyway, uh, apparently he broke his foot. That's what Max Kasser said, at least. But anyway, he's out of action for a while. And since he's he's unavailable, they're creating an interim title. So uh, the issue is, if Tanahashi wins that interim title, he has already been announced for the G1. And uh, that's going to be six weeks exclusively in Japan. So I'm not sure if you're going to uh, create an interim title because CM Punk is going to be unavailable and then give it to a guy who's going to be unavailable working the G1. So my presumption is this means that Moxley is going to end up the champion. But uh, we can go over the full lineup for the G1 after the break. There's uh, 28 entrants, four blocks... So uh, everyone's essentially going to have uh, six matches, but they're over there for six weeks for the tour. So it's going to average out to about a match a week, although obviously they got the uh, stuff at the end of the tour as well. But uh, the big name, we all know the big name in the G1 this year. My main man, Filthy Tom Lawler. So anyway, we'll get into all this after the break. Try and get Semper Vivi on back in a moment. Observer Live. Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Still trying to get Mike connected. But I'm here. And if we can't get him, maybe you'll be here as well. I'll open up them phone lines. But let's get into the rest of this news here. This is the lineup for the G1. What do you guys think of this lineup? We got Okada, Tanahashi, Naito, Goto, Tamatanga, Shingo, Chase Owens, Bad Luck Fale. Yujiro, evil, filthy Tom Lawler, who got a huge pop, by the way, from the crowd, even though they're not supposed to pop, they did. They gasped. Juice Robinson, Jonah, Yoshihashi, Toru Yano, Ishii, Jeff Cobb, everyone's main man, the great Okan, Will Ospreay, Aaron Hanare, Sonata, Jay White, Kenta, El Fantasmo, Taichi, Zack Sabre Jr., Lance Archer, who got the biggest pop of anybody, and David Finlay. That's the lineup for the G1. What do you guys think of this lineup? Dave was uh, somewhat uh, let, I don't know if let down is the right word. I don't want to speak for Dave. But anyway, I didn't think it was the greatest G1 lineup of all time. And I would say with, uh, you know, there's no... Uh, Ibushi in there. There's no Minoru Suzuki. But you know what? If you look at all of these names, even the ones that aren't like big names, like David Finlay is an awesome wrestler. And, uh, you know, I've seen nothing but great matches from Jonah, New Japan Strong. And uh, I think at the end of the day, it's still going to be a pretty damn good tournament, especially because everyone's going to get more time to rest up between matches. So you know they're going to go out there and they're just going to go nuts. And uh, as noted, there's going to be uh, four blocks and, uh, yeah, largest number of uh, entrants into the G1 ever. So that's the lineup there. We also have details of the uh, qualifying match for the AEW All-Atlantic 4-Way coming up at Forbidden Door. If you are not paying attention... There's a new belt in AEW, the All-Atlantic Championship. And uh, we got an exclusive match from wrestlers who live on an island in the Pacific Ocean. So what they're going to do is uh, there's there's uh, four matches. The winners are all going to a four-way. So uh, it's going to be two qualifying matches, which will take place on the June 20th New Japan Road card. In Korokin. The first will be Ishii versus Yoshinobu Kanemaru and uh, Honma against Clark Connors. 
The winners of those matches will then face off the following night at Corican Hall. The winner will then qualify for the four-way match at Forbidden Door on June 26th in Chicago. Now, I think it's either got to be Clark Connors or Ishii, okay? And I love Clark Connors, but we cannot have a Forbidden Door pay-per-view without Tomohiro Ishii. We just can't. So unless I got another match for that guy if he loses, I mean, he's he's got to be in this match. Now, I could see them doing a different match with him and uh, in putting Clark Connors in the four-way. I could see them doing that. But uh, for AEW... We've got, uh, we had Pac beating Buddy Matthews, so he's in. And then this week on Dynamite, we got Miro versus Ethan Page. And then the final match will end up with uh, Penta versus Malachi Black. And of course, the uh, pay per view June 26th, United Center Chicago, John Moxley versus Tanahashi, AW Championship. Interim championship will be determined on that show. It is not official, but Zack Sabre Jr has challenged Brian Danielson for the show. It was a backstage uh, interview after Dominion. He said, American Dragon, can you take some time out of your busy golfing schedule at the Blackpool Country Club to find out who the best technical wrestler in the world is? But I'll tell you now, darling. I can't say what he said, but he says it's him. So, of course, uh, the Best Technical Wrestler Award is named after Brian Danielson in the uh, Observer Awards. And he won, the, he won it, his own award, from 2005 to 2013, which I guess is why it's named after him. Which, by the way, begs the question why the Best Book Award is named after me. Three times I've won that award. And then uh, it was named after Zack Sabre Jr. Uh, from 2014 through 2020 and then Danielson won it again last year so uh you know I it's, it'll, it'll all be political who ends up winning the match you know it'll 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 come down to whatever uh you know ghetto and Tony Khan agree on but I can tell you one thing if Daniel Bryan had his way Zack Sabre Jr. is winning that match so we'll we'll see if he's got the power to make that happen but anyway, hopefully that match is announced soon because you don't, you don't do that tease and you don't have a match that people want to see. Because, you know, like I said, on this, uh, on this show, you ain't going to get all these dream matches that you want. You're just not. I said that from day one. But I'm not saying you can't have any. And I think that this is a great match to put here on this show. So uh, Mudo was going to do an announcement at uh, the Cyberfest Festival. And, of course, uh, Keiji Muto is 59. Uh, he's, he's basically, you know, had no knees for probably about 25 years now. And so everybody figured, well, he's going to announce that he's going to uh, retire. And uh, he did. But he will retire next year. So he's still got a whole bunch of matches. But he's letting you know that next spring he is going to retire. But apparently he has uh, five more matches that he wants to do before his retirement. Uh, did not mention if one of them would be with me. But, you know, I guess I'm available. But anyway, he's going to be announcing uh, next year and uh, return to action after recovering from a left hip injury. So add that to his uh, list of maladies, his hip. So that's the update on him. Uh, we had uh, a bunch of interviews over the last couple of weeks about the NWA Always Ready pay-per-view. And uh, we were wondering, as late as Friday, what in the world are they doing for the main event of this show? Because, of course, it was supposed to be Nick Aldis versus Matt Cardona. But Matt Cardona not only tore his bicep, but had surgery. So he, he would be out. And so what happened was uh, they did a four-way. And uh, the four-way ended up being Trevor Murdoch, Nick Aldis, Sam Shaw, who was the former Dexter Loomis, and uh, Tom Latimer. And so they had a four-way for the uh, vacant title. And it uh, ended with uh, Trevor Murdoch pinning Nick Aldis to become the new NWA World Heavyweight Champion. And afterwards, uh, Cardona showed up, and he was supposed to vacate the title, but he refused. 
And uh, Billy Corgan basically uh, told him, you're vacating the title, brother. So he vacated it. He stormed off. And obviously when he returns, he will be facing whoever is the NWA World Heavyweight Champion at the time. Also, uh, Kenzie Page and Ella Envy, pretty empowered. They defeated Allison Kay and Marty Bell to win the women's tag team titles. And uh, the Commonwealth Connection, Harry Smith and Doug Williams, the same Harry Smith that apparently WWE wanted to brand, what do they want to call him, the uh, uh, Stampede Stud 2022. Anyway, they beat uh, Bestia, uh, Say Say Say, and uh, Mecca Wolf to win the NWA World Tag Team titles for the first time. So they're the champions. And... Uh, that's the main news coming out of the NWA show. WWE also announced the second class of their Next in Line program. 15 college athletes from 14 universities, seven NCAA conferences, seven sports. And, uh, you know, this is our deal where, you know, we give people these, these contracts and uh, then they continue to go to school or whatever including high school, as we learned on NXT. But anyway, I like that they have this list of 15. And, uh, you know, they got all their real names. And uh, they're going to change them, obviously, to these uh, horrible, fake NXT names. But I look at these, and some of these names are pretty cool. We got uh, Case Hatch. He's six foot one. Which, by the way, they list all of these names here, including uh, Thunder Keck. That's the real name. Thunder Keck. They're going to change it. Anyway, they list all of these names. And then, of course, the first thing. The first. They don't announce, like, you know, Thunder, Thunder Keck is a, a football player from Northfield, New Hampshire. No, the first thing they tell you. Is how tall they are and how much they weigh. Thunder Keck, 6'3 and 245. Rachel Glenn, 6 foot. Michaela Hall, 5'5. Five five. Malik Carr, 6'5 and 245 pounds. Because you know it's all about size. You can always tell who the men are and who the women are by the size. You know, this, uh, uh, you know, 5'4", probably a female. 6'5", 245, probably a dude. You know what they're looking for. But anyway, 15 new uh, NIL deals have been uh, have been signed. So there you go, everybody. The future of this promotion. Thunder Keck! Back in a moment, Observer Live. Joe Brian Alvarez here. No Sam... Can't figure out what his, uh, his issue is, but we're working on it. Actually, we're not working on it. He's going to try and work on it. We've done all we can. But it is time for you, you, my friends, to join the show. Phone number. If you want to text, 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. If you want to call, 844-913-2727. That is 844-913-2727. And uh, so busy, I didn't get a chance to look at the chat. And I don't want to uh, call anybody out, but... Of course, the first thing I see when I look at the chat is some bloke going, Has Brian talked about Jeff Hardy yet? Why do you tune in late and then ask if I talked about what was obviously the top story of the day? I mean, hello? Of course I talked about it! Somebody help me out here on the phone. Let's go to Portsmouth. You're on the air. What's up? Hey, what's up, Brian? It's uh, Brandon. Um, happy uh, belated birthday to you, man. Thanks, brother. And, um, yeah, man. And I want to ask, do you think the fans would turn on Athena if she gets booked to be the one who does dethrone um, Jay Cargill? Um I know uh, for sure Sadlander has been very over. You can tell by her reactions. And um, it does resemble what MJF was kind of talking about in that promo. So it's all very interesting. So I just want to get your thoughts on that. Do I think the fans would turn on her? 
Yeah, like if Athena gets the belt instead of Statlander. I see, I like, see, um, I see, I see. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to thank you very much for the call. See, I don't think they would turn on her for that. You know, they they turned on Ruby because Ruby was in the match and they wanted Statlander to win. And so Ruby took the brunt of it. But, you know, if if Ember Moon is is facing Jade and Statlander's just like, you know, nowhere in sight, I don't I don't know. I don't think they would turn on on Ember Moon. I could be wrong. And quite frankly, I mean, if you if you watched uh, Double or Nothing, they really only turned on Ruby for for that night. Uh, you know, by by the time the pay per view came along, you know, Ruby was was super over again. So, um, the only one they really turned on and they kept turning on was uh, was Red Velvet. But uh, you know, Red Velvet she kept getting turned on. Because they kept booking her to beat popular women in their hometown. It was almost like it was by design. I don't know if it was or not, but it happened so frequently that it was almost like there's no way that she's supposed to get cheered. Like, it's just one popular hometown woman after another that Red Velvet's going in there and beating. So, I don't, uh, I don't think so. All right, let's go to uh, the phones. Little Rock, you're on the air. What's going on? Go ahead. You're on the air. Oh, hi. What's up, Brian? What's happening? Uh, what do you think about, well, it's kind of a two-fold question. What do you think about AEW diminishing the value of the interim championship? And should really the Jay White, Switchblade, and JPW title match really go on last and be the main event? What do I th- you, you feel they've devalued the interim title? Well, yeah, I mean, a little bit. I mean, there was the whole debacle with the Battle Royal and, you know, the questionable entrance on maybe, like Dave said over the radio, like maybe they should have just had, like, the few active previous AEW world champions and just have a match there and then the winner be the interim. Well, yeah, I want to thank you very much for the call. So here's the deal. First off, it's hard to devalue something that has no value yet. So I, I can't say that they've devalued the title. Whether the title will have any value will depend on who wins it and uh, and what they do with it after they after they win it. So, uh, would it have been best for them to just have announced, here are the three available former champions. They are going to have a three-way, and the winner is going to be the champion. Yes, that would obviously have been the easiest way to do this. But we have a Forbidden Door pay-per-view that's coming up at the end of June. And so this whole punk thing obviously wasn't planned. It wasn't planned for him to get injured. It wasn't planned for him to have to, uh, you know, do the interim championship deal. But once that was done, okay, well, now we got to figure out what are we going to do for this interim title? And, you know, because of Forbidden Door, they wanted a New Japan guy, and they wanted an AEW guy. And uh, and then they had to figure out how to get there. And, yes, I would have... It, the Battle Royal, the Winter Faces, Moxley, uh, a match on Dominion. Like, there's a lot of stuff going on. But I think the idea was, listen, we're in this situation right here. And and what can we do to, like, capitalize on it? And clearly their idea, and, you know, Dynamite did a very good number. It was number one on cable this week. You know, the idea was we, we do a Battle Royal at the beginning of the show. And then we do the winner against Moxley at the end of the show. That's two big matches on the show. And then, you know, New Japan can do a Dominion match, which, you know, maybe we can, you know, garner some interest for Dominion by doing an, an AEW uh, qualifier there. So it's just a lot of different things to try to bring eyeballs. Was it was it perfect? No. Does it have any and, – and it really does no bearing on, on what happens with the championship. If uh, John Moxley wins that interim title and this bro goes on a tear and he's smashing dudes and having great matches on TV and, you know, he can bring a lot of value to the interim title. And then, you know, if he's a great interim champion and then Punk comes back, I mean, it'll feel like a big match when they do the unification. So it is too early to determine if there is an issue with the interim title. If you want to say that it's been too convoluted, like my explanation just now, go for it. 
I would agree there's too much stuff going on, but there's a reason for it. It's not just done for the sake of being convoluted. Dagan, you're on the air, bro. What's up? What's going on, bro? No one else well, could possibly off, be calling from Bellows Falls. <laughs> I don't think there's any uh, anybody else listening to the show from Bellows Falls, Vermont. But uh, first off, Brian, happy birthday, my friend. Thank uh, you. I wanted to get that out of there. 40 years old. Can't even I, believe it. I'm working on that song for the contest tomorrow, so that should be fun. Um, wanted to get your thoughts on this G1. Uh, we have four blocks now. So do you think that they will have the top point getters in each block face off in sort of a semifinal thing where you have like A block winner versus B block winner and then C block winner versus D block winner on the other side and then the two face off in the finals, the winners of that? How would you book this, Brian? You know what I do, Dan? You know what I do? You know what I do? Here's what I do. What would you do, Brian? All right. So we got uh, we got four blocks. Which we don't even know the blocks yet, okay? But let me uh, let me get some names, and uh, completely at random, I'm gonna pick uh, I'm gonna pick four winners. So let's say that uh, Dagan out of here, so we can get the next bloke on the line. Uh, let's say that your four winners end up being uh, Okada wins a block, Tanahashi wins a block, Naito wins a block, and filthy Tom Lawler wins a block. Four winners. Ah, what do you do with four winners? Well, you could do a four-way. I don't like that idea. So what I would do, uh, you know what I'd do? I would say, here are your four winners. And what we're going to do is we're going to leave it up to the fans. And you let the fans pick the two semifinal matches with those four individuals. So maybe the fans want to They want to see Okada versus Filthy and Tanahashi versus Naito. Or maybe they want to see Naito versus Okada for the 555th time and Tanahashi versus Filthy. You let the fans pick those two semis and then ba-bam, you have the finals. That's what I'd do. Just to have a little bit of something different. You know what I'm saying? It's already different. There's already 28 guys in four blocks. We could do something different. So, uh, yeah, that's what I'd do. Because I'm a man. You know what I am, everybody? I'm a man of the people. That's what I am. Uh, let's go to uh, Honolulu. You're on the air. What's going on? Hey, hey. Happy birthday. Thank you. Um, this might be an unpopular opinion here, but I don't think any title should exist if it doesn't have a purpose. Well, like, yeah. What's the point of a TNT champion? Besides aesthetically. What, are you the best wrestler on TNT? Well, uh, you know, based on the name of the belt, uh, yes, he's, I guess, the best wrestler on TNT. Wouldn't that just be the heavyweight champion, though? Well, here's, here's the deal, my friend. You're, 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 you're right, but, uh, but here's the deal. So uh, you, have a, you have a world heavyweight champion, okay? This is the pinnacle of the sport, your World Heavyweight Championship. It is a belt that everybody should want to vie for. You get into this business because you want to be, in storyline, the World Heavyweight Champion. In real life, you get into this business because you want to make a lot of money and provide for your family. But in storyline, you want this this belt made a cubic zirconian, whatever. So, that's the main title. Now, to keep the prestige... Of the main title. That main title should largely only be defended on major events. Pay-per-views. You run some show in a stadium with 25,000 people. Etc, etc. But you should also have a title that is defended more regularly on television. So I don't have a problem whatsoever with having a secondary TNT title. Okay? Now, this is because of the size of the roster. Okay, I don't have a problem with uh, Jade Cargill having a TBS championship. They're like being a secondary women's title. But uh, if you have a far fewer number of women, you may only need one big belt that they fight for. But, you know, it's all about equality, even though it's it's about equality, except the rosters aren't equal. Like if there were a hundred women and a hundred men, 
then it would be equal. Then you would have an equal number of championships. But if you have 100 women and 20 men, we still have to make it equal, even though it's unequal. But anyway, but then we move on. Now we've got this, uh, you know, we had the FTW title, which really is, is, you know, people complain about that and everything, but it doesn't really count. It's like, it's a belt that's only going to be in Taz's stable. It never changes hands. It's rarely defended. Uh, it's just kind of like a, you know, part of Taz's gimmick. We don't need it. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, when people make a list of titles and they're complaining, it's like they don't ever really do anything with that belt. But uh, this All-Atlantic title, have you ever, uh, you know what scarcity is? You know what that is? You know, there's, uh, you, you want a certain car, but you can't get it. There's like, it's back ordered for three years. But I mean, you could go to the uh, car dealership and just grab a car. But, you know, you want the car you can't have. It's scarcity. That's that's what this championship thing should be about. Uh, the championship should be scarce. Instead, now it's like there's 50 championships. Oh, you know, I really wanted the world title, but and actually it's a storyline. I really wanted the world title, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll just go for the TNT title now. And then we're going to have the all Amer- you know, the all all Atlantic title, which they haven't said in storyline, but it's basically like, you know, you guys weren't in the the uh, battle royal for a shot at the the main title cuz now you're in a tournament for this, you know, tertiary title. So, like the more titles you have, the less value all of the titles have. Not just the world title, but all of them. So anyway, I we don't need this belt. It it's uh it's unneeded, you know, I'd be okay with trios titles. But we have way too many singles titles as it is, and uh, that takes away the uh, the titles being special, which is what you don't want to do. The title should be the number one thing. And you know what? Making people happy. Oh, let's have a belt for these guys. Too bad. It's not about making everybody happy. It's about making that title special, and not everybody gets it. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Bruce is here, Wrestling Observer Live. We're trying to figure out what's up with Semper Vivi so he can return tomorrow. But uh, a couple of text messages. Are you going, are we going to give Jeff Hardy unlimited chances to not learn his lessons and watch how this ends as they all usually do? Well, who's we? But no, I don't think that's going to happen. But nothing is official at this point. Marcella says, Brian agreed on the title. What makes it so special as well? Is the talks on who should have had the title and who did it. I mean, if Arn had ever gotten the heavyweight title, would he be as relevant as he is today or a Jack Swagger? Also, Stampede and Stud is my favorite Brazzers film. Hope you had a good day. Thanks, Marcelo. This person says, I'm baffled. They're doing Riddle versus Roman on SmackDown next week and not Money in the Bank, which is in Vegas, which is in Riddle's hometown. They can build him up and do their favorite thing, beat him in his hometown. Well, the bigger issue is, uh, you know, they want to make money. And uh, they've already made their money off Peacock. So, you know, putting Roman Reigns on Money in the Bank means absolutely zero to WWE. They don't make one dime if more people watch it because Roman Reigns is on there. But if they do big SmackDown ratings as a result of Roman Reigns defending the title on the show, well, then it comes time to uh, renew your uh, television deal, and you make even more money. So, uh, you know, we knew this was going to happen when they sold to Peacock, and that is that you ain't going to get those pay-per-views you used to get. You know, you're going to get something, and they're going to give you matches. But, like, the big stuff, I mean, it's going to be at uh, WrestleMania, or it's going to be in Saudi Arabia, or, uh, you know, wherever they're going to get the most money for this stuff. They don't make any more money on Peacock. They've made their money. They're done. So uh, that's why. Hey, listen, we're out of time. I want to thank you all for listening here today. Callers, listeners, and uh, Semper Vivi, everyone at studio, Dom. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Wrestling Observer Live.